here we go. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit. Heaviness, lift up, up your voice to God. Praise with the spirit and with understanding. Oh, magnify the Lord. All you that mourn in Zion, I have authority to appoint unto you in Zion. Praise for the spirit of heaviness, lift up your voice to God. Praise with the spirit and with understanding, oh magnify the Lord. Lift up your hands that hang down, lift up your voice now still. Give unto God continuous praise, sing for the Zion's hill. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, lift up your voice to God. Praise with the spirit and with understanding, oh magnify the Lord. Sing to Yahweh, hallelujah. Worship and praise our God. Praise and adore Him. Bow down before Him. Oh, magnify the Lord. Put on the garment of praise from the spirit of heaviness. Lift up your voice to God. Praise with the spirit and with understanding. Oh, magnify the Lord. Put on the garment of Praise for the spirit of heaviness, lift up your voice to God. Praise with the spirit and with understanding, oh magnify the Lord. Amen. Amen. Welcome everyone, welcome to another online church service. Hello Phil. How are you Brad? Hey Fred, how are you doing? Hello. Yeah Fred's well. Fred's very well. Good morning everyone. We just thought we'd do something a little different. Um, you know, it's it's interesting times we're in. It's interesting situations that, that we can be going through as individuals, whether that be financially, whether that be spiritually, whatever it may be. But we need to lift up the garments of praise. We need to, mm. need to give praise and worship and thanks to our mighty God. Mighty because God. when it comes down to it, no, regardless of our finances, regardless of our health, regardless of our situations, the only answer is Jesus Christ. Mm. It is only Jesus who is going to lift you up, who is going to restore you. You know, if you know Jesus, He has delivered you. He has he's brought you to a place of freedom. If you don't know Him this morning, then I want to encourage you to get to know Him. And if you do know Him, get to know Him some more. Yeah, What's more. next, boys? I exalt thee. That's a good one, Brad. This one's very majestic. Thou, O Lord, art high above all Exalted far above all gods. Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. I exalt thee. Exalted far above all gods. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. I exalt thee. 
God, we thank you, we give you praise, we exalt you, Father God. We exalt you right now, Father. We lift you up on high. We thank you, Father God, for the work that you're doing in our lives, in and through us, Father God. We thank you that your precious Son, Jesus Christ, died on the cross, that he rose again, that we live in new life, that our sins are forgiven because of his precious, precious blood. That is worth giving praise. That is worth giving glory. Let's take a moment. Just to exalt the Lord. If you've got a, a tongue, then, then bring a tongue because we need to use the gifts that we've been freely given. Now is not the time to hold back. Now is the time to seek God and use the gifts that He freely gives us at His will. His power needs to be released within His church and within our communities. Reach out now. Thank you, Mari. Oh, Mama Lada. Oh, Rapa Papa Kashara Bakari, Auntie Helakara, Shara Baki, 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 Thank you, Lord. We exalt you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for your protection over each and every one of us, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for your healing power. Thank you, mighty God, that we can stand strong in your authority and in your name. We thank you, Lord, that your word says that we will do greater things than you. Because you have given us authority and we can go in your name. Amen. Amen. As the deer panter for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. This next song was the song that they played at the end of that series on TV, The Blink of an Eye, I Need Thee, Every yeah. Hour. That's the music they played at the end. It's a beautiful song. It is. It's a great number. Not only do we need him every hour, we need him every minute, we need him every second if you are struggling, if you are worried about what's going on in this world, then I encourage you to reach out and say, Jesus, Jesus, you have the answer. Jesus, you are my strength. You are my shield. And I hope and pray that Jesus is your heart's desire. Gracious 
Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, need thee. lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every heart I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to joy or pain come quickly down in mind all life is vain I need thee oh I need thee every hour I need thee oh bless me now my soul I come to Thee. I need Thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me Thine indeed, Thou blessed Son. I need take a moment just to go and grab a biscuit and some juice as um, Pastor Kathy Russell brings communion. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Brad and Phil, for that wonderful worship. Thank you, Fred, for choosing those songs. How appropriate they are for the season that we're in, for this difficult time that we're all experiencing. And particularly, the last song really ministered to me, I need thee. I need thee every hour. And sometimes now I need Jesus 15 times in five minutes that I need him. I need his strength. I need his encouragement. We need to hold on to Jesus in this season that we're in. The words, I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. You know, we need to hear Jesus speaking into the storms of our life. We need to hear him. He is the God who calms the storm. He is the Jesus who walked on the water. He is the Jesus who says, peace be still. We need to hear his voice to calm the storms in our lives. I need thee every hour. Stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. You know, we can, we can feel tempted to quit. We can feel tempted to give up. We, it's just too hard. But when we sense the presence of Jesus, when we remember that his spirit dwells in us, the spirit of Christ lives in us, and he's promised to never leave us or forsake us, we can draw strength and encouragement from that. I need thee every hour in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is in vain. We are going through massive pain right now, massive emotional pain, massive physical pain, massive pain as a society, financial pain, pain on all fronts. And this is the season of pain that we're in. And we need him. Oh, we need him. We need Jesus in our joyful moments. We need him in our sad. I need thee every hour. Teach me your will. And thy, promise, thy rich promises in me fulfill. You know, the promises of God are the things that can pull us through. 
If we don't know the promises of God, then we've got nothing to hang on to. But if we read the words of Jesus and we see the promises of God in the Bible, we'll always find something that we can hang on to. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. We need to understand that. We need to cry out to Jesus in our terror, in our pain, in our despair, in our hurt, in our bewilderment. Cry on him for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We can call on him and he will come. I need thee every hour, most holy one. O oh, make me thine indeed, O oh, blessed Son. Those who've, of us who have called upon Jesus, who have invited him to come into our heart and be our Lord, be supreme in authority in our life, be our God and our Lord. Jesus is working in our lives to make us more and more like himself. He's making more sons. He's making more daughters. And he's using the trials of life and the storms that we face to shape and mould our character, to strengthen us, to refine our faith and make it, made it prove genuine. Jesus is using this season for the church to grow, to step up into her authority, to step up into her power and to start to take back what the devil has stolen. We need to step up. Jesus stepped up for us. He went to the cross for us. This is the season and the hour when we need to step up for him and we can't do it unless we rely on Jesus every single second, every single minute. We need you, Jesus. We need you. We need you in our personal lives. We need your strength that your word offers us. We need you for our nation. We need you for our state. We need you, Jesus. And So we thank you that you've gone ahead of us, that you've blazed the trail. We thank you, Jesus, because you went ahead of us and blazed a trail, that your body was broken for us, that by your wounds we could receive healing for spirit, for soul, for body. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that your blood was shed for us so that we could become sons and daughters of God, so the blood of Jesus flowed and washed our sins away and the blood of Jesus purchased us as slaves from, of sin and brought us into his kingdom, the kingdom of the sun, the kingdom of light. We're here today because of the shed blood and the broken body of Jesus. We're here to remember what Jesus did and said for us, and then to take that to the world, to take it to the world, to take it to our loved ones, to take it to those we're in contact with. This is a season when we need to rely on Jesus more than we ever have before, and that's the only way we're going to make it. That's the only way we're going to get through this, to individually and corporately hang on to Jesus like we've never hung on to him before and cry out to him, tell him that we need him and invite him into our circumstances and our situation. Father, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Jesus, that you were prepared to do that, that you were prepared to be feel forsaken so that we would never have to experience it. So I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for your great love and your great mercy that you went to the cross for us to bear our sin, to take our sicknesses, to bring us into new life with the Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's eat. And if you have a healing need in your body, reach out to Jesus and thank him that by his wounds, by his stripes, you have been healed and made whole. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. By your stripes I have been healed and made whole. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. By your stripes everybody that's watching this has been healed and made whole. We release your healing power to flow now, Lord Jesus. We release your healing power now in Jesus' name. That everyone taking communion right now is healed in Jesus' name. Thank you for your abiding presence. Thank you for your healing presence flowing over everybody watching this right now in Jesus' name. And thank you, Jesus, for giving up your life, for shedding your blood so that we could be forgiven and cleansed and made sons and daughters of God. Thank you, Jesus. Let's drink. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we honour you and exalt you. We praise and magnify you. We thank you that when we cry out to you in need, you come and meet that need. We thank you that because you are the Lord, our shepherd, we shall not want. 
we shall lack nothing. Thank you that you've given us everything we need for life and godliness. Thank you, God, that you've blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Father, we cry out to you and reach out to you in faith. We thank you that those things are released in our lives. We praise you and we thank you for our needs being met. But chiefly, Lord, we thank you that we all have that abiding sense of your presence, guiding us, comforting us and strengthening us on this journey, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Kathy, for your communion message. Thank you so much. It's such a blessing to, to all of us. Yeah. Is it well with your soul? It's well with my soul. Yeah. Oh, it's going good, mate. Yep. It's got to be one of my favourites, to be honest. When, when peace like a river attends all our ways, when sorrows like sea. hope and trust that it will be well with your soul for the rest of this week so as you go about your week just 
be encouraged that God is your strength. He is mm. your shield. He, he is constantly with you. He lives and dwells within you. So Jesus. if you're having a flat moment, then unfortunately, suck it up. Give it to Jesus because he's the only answer. Bless you guys. See you, Phil. See you, See you Fred. See you, See you Fred. guys. Bye. See you, Frank. See you, Kathy. Well, good morning, Southside. I hope you've been enjoying the service so far. And now we're going to take a short little journey through God's Word. If you have a Bible with you, you might like to turn to the book of Matthew and chapter 14. We're going to read one of the very well-known accounts, one of the well-known Bible stories that I hope um, that what we find in it this morning will be a little bit different to what perhaps you've heard before, if you've heard much on it. The same story is also found in... Um, Sorry, the same account. Story makes it sound like it might be pretend. The same account is also found in Mark chapter 6 and John chapter 6. Uh, but we're looking at, uh, at the way it's been recorded by Matthew. And reading from verse 22, we have the account of Jesus walking on the water. It says, Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. And after he dismissed them, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Oh, you of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they'd climbed into the boat, sorry, when, yeah, they, that's Peter and Jesus, climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Father, as we look at your word this morning, I pray you put your blessing upon it and reveal its truth to us, that we might understand, that we might believe, and we might act on what you reveal to us this day. In Jesus' holy and wonderful name. Amen. You know, I find at least five or six completely different messages in this handful of verses from Matthew chapter 14. Um, but the emphasis I want to put this morning is on Peter and the four choices that Peter had to make. Now to start off in the very first line, it says immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. The Greek word there is amakadso, that's translated as made, and it literally means necessitate or compel. So Jesus didn't suggest to the boys, now would be a good time to hop, on, uh, hop in the boat and have a row across the lake. He said, you will go and you will go now. Now don't forget we're dealing with uh, at least half of his disciples were fishermen and all of them had grown up in the vicinity of the lake. They knew what it was like. They could read the season. They could read the skies. They could read the waters. It was probably already windy. And I'm sure they were thinking, Lord, surely you don't want us to go out on the water now because there is a storm coming. No, you go now. Now, there's a sort of a, a wimpy thing that runs through a lot of modern Christians thinking, if I become a Christian, there won't be any, any difficulty, nothing's going to be hard, nothing's going to be a trial, because Jesus is going to be there, he'll be my cushion and my pillow, and he'll carry me all through it, and it'll be like having a teddy bear to hold on to all the time, and everything will be cushy. That's not the truth. Don't believe what some of the American televangelists may tell you. It's not all tiptoe through the tulips after you put your hand in the hand of Jesus. In fact, it's the toughest, bravest and most difficult thing you'll ever do because your life will change so profoundly and so radically and you will declare war on Satan by assigning your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Christianity is not for wimps. It's not for the weaklings. It's for the strong. And those of you who have made that decision are very, very strong. You have been called into that strength. You have been called because you have responded that way. Many who turn away from Jesus don't have the courage to pursue him. 
or they are fearful of the consequences. And sometimes those consequences can be severe, as we see in this story. But remember this. Jesus made them go for a reason. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. And after he dismissed them, it says in verse 23, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So Jesus sent them into a difficult situation. But what was he doing while they were doing that? He went to his father in prayer. You and I need to do the same thing. If someone around us or a group of people around us are doing it tough, we need to be in prayer. Right now at the moment, half of the, the uh, citizens in Victoria are in terror of COVID virus and the other half are in denial. And the truth is somewhere in between the two. Yes, it's nasty. No, it's nowhere near as much as the worst that's been ascribed to it, but it's more than something as simple as a common cold. But people have this mixture, but when we find people who are living their lives in terror and fear, and the government seems to be just daily pouring more fuel onto the fear and doing very little about assuaging it, telling us how bad it is. How many times have you seen, for example, Daniel Andrews stand up for a press conference and say, well, praise God, we have 500 people less with COVID today because they have completely recovered from it. No, he can't wait to tell you how many more there are. And the world will pour the negatives onto you. People around you have the negatives poured onto them. They don't want you pouring more on. What we need to do is what Jesus did and pray. We need to pray for the government. We need to pray for the people who are hiding in fear. We need to pray for the lady who crosses the road to walk on the other side because she's too terrified to walk on the same side of the street as someone else. We need to pray for those people who are in fear and who are in turmoil because of what's happening around them. Jesus does that for you and he does it for me. He intercedes with the Father on our behalf. He sent them into this trial, but he did not send them alone. His eye is still on them. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went on. Oh, fourth watch of the night, uh, the Jewish night starts at six o'clock. They have watches that are three hours long. Uh, changing the guard, if you like. So 6 to 9 is the first watch, 9 to 12 is the second, 12 to 3 is the third watch of the night, and the fourth watch of the night, which is what we're talking about here, is between 3 uh, three a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. So somewhere between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning, Jesus went out onto the water. So they'd been rowing all night in the dark, in the storm, while Jesus was up on the hills praying for them and praying for their... their uh, endurance and praying for their protection there came the point when he said enough's enough now is the time and somewhere after 3 a.m jesus went out to them walking on the lake pretty spectacular way to go up until now jesus hadn't demonstrated that he was lighter than water no one else had done, ever done this before jesus made it look easy um, when they saw him they were terrified it's a ghost they said and cried out in fear now, we've got to be careful that when we're having a tough time, we don't shrivel up in fear. We don't become petrified as they did. We don't become so introverted, so focused on ourselves, so concerned about how I feel, how so concerned about poor little me, what will I do next, that we forget to look at Jesus and that when he does appear, we don't even recognize him. These are his 12 disciples, the 12 men closest to him on planet Earth, and they don't even recognize him when he comes. Yes, it's dark, but it's not that dark. When Jesus comes, make sure you're aware of it. They cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus said to them, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. You cry out to Jesus Christ and listen for a response. Don't keep bellowing, Oh, Jesus, where are you? Oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. And going on and on and on and on and on and on and giving God no chance to reply. Cry out to him, as they did, and listen for a response. Because if it's Jesus, there will be one. It may not come when you want it. It may not come in the way you want it, but it will most certainly come. Take courage, he said. It is I, don't be afraid. 
addressing their immediate needs and problems. Now, do you think that Jesus was leaving them in this situation alone? It says in one of the other accounts, I'm pretty sure it's the one in John chapter 6, that he saw from the shore that they were struggling. Jesus had eyes better than ours. He could see the trial they were in. And he knew when the time was right to go to them. He said this, take courage it is I, don't be afraid. Here's Peter's first choice. Because everyone else is cowering in the bottom of the boat, hiding, peering over the edge to see what's this strange apparition that's coming. First choice of Peter is to call out or to cower with all the rest. Now sometimes when things are going hard, we need someone around us to either take the lead and call out or we rise to the occasion and be courageous and cry out and call on God. And the more of us that do that, the more powerful and effective it is. If a whole church unites in prayer, it's powerful and releases the hand of God. In this case, Peter chose to call and not to cower. So this first point is courage. And you need courage in the face of adversity. The courage to call on God, not cower down and knuckle down under the adversity. The courage to rise above it and call to God. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. He's had the courage to call, but he's, he's issued to God the most ludicrous challenge I think I've ever heard come out of a man's mouth. Lord, if it's you, call me to come to you on the water. Jesus answers with one word, come. Now, Peter is caught in another bind. He's called to God. God has responded. Now his second choice is to obey or to stay. Now, I don't know about you. It would have been very tempting to stay in the bottom of the boat. Peter's a fisherman. Peter has had two and a half or so decades of experience of water. Peter knows that water won't hold you up. Peter's been on the water and in the water often enough to know it does not work. You can't walk on water. You can sail a boat on it. You can float things on it. But if you stand on it, you go through it. He has asked a silly thing. God has responded and said, yeah, okay, come. Now he has the, the choice. Do I follow my sense knowledge, my experience, the things that I've gathered over the years, or do I trust in you, O Lord, and believe that if you call me to do it, I can? So his second choice is to obey or to stay. If you like, compliance with the word of God. Now, God will often put a challenge like that to you and I. There are many things that we are called to do that completely defy our natural knowledge and our natural experience. And we have a choice whether we are going to follow the inclinations of the past, the, 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 the rail up, railway line of past experience, or whether we're going to jump off the thing and go God's way. Well, praise God, Peter had the courage to obey. And Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water to Jesus. Wow. You can do it if God calls you to do it. There are so many different things in life that God will call you to do. You think couldn't be done, can be done. But when he saw the wind, this is Peter, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Uh, we see this in Christianity a lot. I've seen it in my own life too many times. I'm ashamed of them. Where we start to follow God, we start to obey the call, but then we begin looking around at all of the things that are against us and we start listening to that voice of old experience and old rationalization and reason again. And we start thinking, hang on a minute. I can't really do this. This is beyond me. This is not something that I can do. What am I doing out here standing on water? It can't be done. So Peter's third choice was to go over to where Jesus was or to go under. This is the first time he took, took the wrong choice. He took more heed and credence of the wind and the waves than he did of the word of Christ to come 
And even though he'd already stepped off the boat onto the water and experienced that it can work, now he's beginning to slip and he's starting to sink because he's decided, oh, hang on, no, 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 you really can't do this after all, even though I've been doing it. You be careful in your uh, walk before God that your courage doesn't slip and that you don't begin to waver in your compliance with God's word, with God's call. Everything God wants of you is in this Bible. You don't need some anointed prophet to come along and tell you. You don't need some amazing pastor or some colossal teacher to come along and tell you. It's all in this Bible. This is God's love letter to you, giving you instructions on life. But you can choose to obey it or not to obey it. You can choose to refer to it or not to. That's free will. God gave us that. Peter, for a moment, has looked away. Watch Jesus' response. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Well, there's a testing of faith. Not starting the walk, that was a faith step. But the real faith that, need, that Peter needed to show was the faith to keep on walking, not to fall over at the first hurdle. And so many times, so many of us will tend to fall at the first hurdle. We don't hold on to Jesus Christ through thick and thin. We hold on while it's comfortable. We hold on while it's easy. We hold on while we can cope with things around us in our own strength. But as soon as things start to go a bit pear-shaped or we start losing our way, immediately, oh, heaven, help me. What am I doing out here? Let's run away. It's hard to run when you're on water, but you can sink. And that's what Peter started to do. But Jesus said, no, Peter, I won't let that happen to you. And he lifted him up. And he didn't wait. He lifted him up. As soon as Peter's life was in jeopardy, God was there. If you think God has left you sitting in a hole for a while, he hasn't left you in a hole that's going to kill you, nor will he. He's lifting you up to keep you out of it. He will rescue you and redeem you just as he did with Peter. So there are consequences to falling away from God's word and beginning to listen to that inner voice of doubt instead of the heart confession of ability. And when they'd climbed into the boat, the wind died down and then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Those who were in the boat include Peter. Peter's first act when he got back into that boat was to drop to his knees and worship his God. Now, this was the final choice that he had. Pride or praise. Peter could have got into the boat, and most of us would have. Hey, <laughs> do you see me? That was me. I got out there and walked on that. Did you, did, you, did you cop a load of this? Step over the side. How courageous was I? How cool was I? How good? Did you see me get three or four steps out from the boat? Wasn't I amazing? Let's not worry about what happened after that. But up to that point, wasn't I amazing? Look at me. Aren't I great? You can't tell me there wasn't a large element of that in Peter. You 11 just sooked and grizzled in the bottom of the boat, but me, I had the courage of a bear. I got over the side and I walked out towards Jesus. Aren't I wonderful? Gee, you see that happen a lot. God does things for someone and they begin to take to themselves the credit for what's been done. And they begin to glory in self-adulation and self-praise. It happens to ministries. It happens to individuals. And it leads to downfall. It also has consequences. Peter didn't choose the path of pride. Peter chose the path of hum humility. I'm only back in this boat because Jesus took me by the hand, lifted me up when my faith failed. He made up the deficit. And he helped me back into this boat and he dropped on his knees beside the 11 others and together they worshipped Jesus Christ. Pride or praise? Humility. His fourth choice was Christ. And for me always, it has to be Jesus Christ. I'm nothing, I'm nobody, I'm unknown, but I'm in Jesus Christ and he's everything, he is everybody, and he's known everywhere throughout the universe. Through him, the whole universe was created. 
Now it's not said so much here as it is in, uh, in uh, the other two accounts, but John records that the moment Peter and Jesus step back into the boat, it immediately reached the far shore. Immediately, it's out of crisis. And it's out of crisis because of one man's faith, one man's action, one man's commitment. It led to salvation and release for everyone. Hey, wouldn't it be great to be a Peter? Now that things are going bad, we're in a, a, a terrible situation. We look at our government and, and we think, oh heavens, they very obviously can't help us. They obviously don't have the, the, the comprehension, the ability, the skill to help us. They've, they've got us into a colossal hole, but they have no idea how to get us back out of it again. Jesus does. Men are useless. Women are useless in an absolute crisis. Jesus Christ is your one hope. I'm not saying men and women aren't helpful. I'm not saying they won't do everything they can to support you. But don't rely on them. Rely on Jesus Christ. Don't rely on leaders. Rely on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to bring you out of a deep crisis. And you will come out of that deep crisis. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And then those who were with him worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Next time God blesses you, don't forget to go back and say thanks. Next time God does something amazing in your life, don't forget to drop on your knees and say thank you, Jesus. And don't forget to tell everyone you see what Jesus has done for you. Not, I did this, I accomplished this, or my doctor did this, or my counsellor did that, or my friends did that. What God did. Give credit where it's due and let him bless you some more. I thank you, Father. And I thank you that the experience of Peter has so many facets. Today we've only looked at these four questions. And he answered them. And I pray we will answer them. And I'm so thankful that on the third one, he failed. But you, Jesus, extended your arm to lift him up because so often I fail. And so often the people who are watching this today fail because we're all human. None of us are perfect in faith and perfect in action. And God, you don't hold that against us. There was not one word of criticism that came from the lips of Jesus Christ regarding Peter having a, a, a crisis in faith and beginning to go the wrong way as he started to sink. Not a word of condemnation or criticism, only the powerful hand of Jesus to lift him up. And I praise you, God, that that is the way it's always been and it still is. And I thank you, Lord, that where we have failed you, we can still turn to you and be lifted and redeemed. And I thank you, Father, that you are the answer that we have. And through your Son, we have access to the paths of life, both here and now and tomorrow. I thank you that salvation is not just for today. It's an experience while we walk on earth, but it's an eternal glory at your side. And I thank you, Lord, that you have given this to us free of charge in Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you all, and we'll be back with you next Sunday. Goodbye for now.